It's the week ending Saturday the 9th of October and this is The Week Unwrapped. In the past seven days, we've seen a WHO-approved malaria vaccine rolled out to children across Africa, a former Facebook employee accusing the company of putting profit over safety at a Senate hearing in Washington, and after being postponed three times, the latest James Bond movie, smashing box office records. But we're here to bring you some stories that passed under the radar this week. Big news not making headlines right now, but with repercussions for all our lives. I'm Ollie Mann, and let's unwrap the week. And joining us today from the week's digital team is Mr. Joe Evans and the boss man, Holden Frith. And from the week USA, it's Jessica Hullinger. Uh, Joe, it feels like you haven't been on the show for ages. I presume that's because nothing has been happening overseas. But what do you think this week should be remembered for? How heated conflict contributes to the climate crisis. An oil tanker in trouble in a troubled region. The rusty vessel named Safer has more than a million barrels of crude oil on board. It's been stranded off the Ras Isa oil terminal on Yemen's west coast for more than five years. Ownership of its valuable cargo is contested between Yemen's internationally recognised government and their Houthi enemies. While it rots in the sun, the UN deems the tanker so unsafe that it could wreck ecosystems and livelihoods for decades if its cargo leaks. Laura Bird and Manley reporting for Al Jazeera in July 2020, Joe. So there was a stranded oil tanker then. I presume this is your story of the week because it's still there? Quite right. So a New York story has drawn attention to a massive rusting oil tanker which is trapped off the shore of Yemen and is in serious danger of causing what would be an absolute environmental catastrophe. Um, the SFO Safa is essentially trapped within the war zone between the Yemeni government and the Houthi armed movement. Since 2014, it's received basically no maintenance at all, um, and it's estimated to hold 1.14 million barrels of crude oil. So essentially, if this thing sinks, if it sets on fire or if it explodes, which is also a possibility, the estimates are that it could cause the death of thousands of people who are already reliant on the ecosystem and are living through one of the world's worst humanitarian crises anyway. So why can't it just be sailed off somewhere safer? The FSO bit of the name means floating storage and offloading facility, doesn't it? Is is that why? You, you can't move it? So the problem's actually a kind of manifold. The first one is that it's currently only staffed by a skeleton crew um, and is what's known as a dead ship, which essentially means that the steam boiler ran out of fuel in 2017, so it can't just be simply sailed away. There's also suggestions that the Houthis have laid mines around it under the sea, meaning that approaching it could be highly dangerous. And it's also 45 years old, which is incredibly old to still be being used as an oil tanker. Now, that wouldn't matter so much if it had been maintained properly, but given that it hasn't been maintained properly for such a long time, it's been likened to the Beirut warehouse, which exploded last year and, and wiped out large swathes of the city, because the, the fear of this explosion is becoming greater and greater, and the maintenance work doesn't look like it's going to be done anytime soon. Yeah, and Jess, that explosion in Beirut killed 218 people uh, and destroyed nearly 80,000 apartments. And I remember at the time people saying this had been predicted for ages if only the government had done something about it. And it feels like that. You know, here is a prediction. <laughs> here it is. It's being talked about. No one's doing anything. Right. Well, it's not necessarily that no one is doing anything. It's that um, there have been attempts made to do something that have been blocked. So several um, humanitarian agencies, the UN, they've attempted to move or drain or even just go and assess the state of this ship. And they have been turned away. The Houthis have denied them access over and over again. So they it's not that there's no one trying to, to solve this problem. It's just really hard to do so. And um, seems like the Houthis are sort of using this ticking time bomb as essentially as leverage, right? They know that that they control it and um, that as long as they, as people are concerned about it, they have a little bit of leverage. In a way, they're sort of blackmailing <laughs> the entire international community, um, which is really scary and dangerous. Yeah, because if it goes off, Holden, it is the Houthis that are going to be most uh, affected by it, isn't it? It's, it's their people, it's their civilians that are living nearby. Seems a strange kind of leverage. It is. It's, it, they've sort of taken themselves hostage in, in, in a way. It would affect... Yemen most acutely, it would affect the livelihoods of the people who um, fish along that coast. A lot of people depend on desalinated seawater to drink. 
Um, if you have oil clogging up that machinery, that, that no longer becomes an option. But it would also have much wider environmental effects, which I think you can imagine if you're releasing you know, millions of barrels of oil into the sea, but also effects on the world's shipping lanes. Um, depending on which way the oil drifted um, and which way the sea currents took it, it could end up in a shipping lane at the end of the Suez Canal through which um, about 10% of the world's trade passes each year. The um, estimation is that an oil slick resulting from from the SAFA would take months to clean up. So you can see the scale of the problem there. Yeah, and I saw one stat, admittedly from 2018, from UNICEF, Joe, estimating that if the port closed, just if the port closed for any reason at all, 300,000 children would be at risk of dying from starvation or disease. The numbers are just quite staggering. But the background, obviously, is the war in Yemen, which is something that isn't very well covered over here. Can you give us a sort of background there? What is happen- What is the current status in Yemen? What- why are we in this position? Yes, yeah, so as you say, it is a very complicated war and it's also an ethnic and religious war which makes it all the more complicated to explain. But essentially, it has its roots in the failure of the political transition after the Arab Spring uprising. When the country's authoritarian president handed over power to his deputy, his deputy then struggled to deal with a variety of problems from attacks by jihadists, separatist movements, and also the fact that the security personnel in uh, Yemen remained loyal to the former president. The Houthi movement then sort of fought a series of rebellions um, in the south of the country and eventually took control of the northern heartland. And disillusioned with the transition of power that the Arab Spring created, many ordinary Yemenis, including lots of Sunni Muslims, supported the Houthis. So that's sort of how we've ended up in the situation we're in now. This has only been exacerbated by the fact that, alarmed by the rise of the Houthis, Shia Muslim countries like Iran and Saudi Arabia began an air campaign um, targeting the uprising. In short, what this has led to is the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. Um, At least 7,700 civilians have died so far in Saudi-led coalition airstrikes. 80% of the population need humanitarian assistance and protection, according to latest UN figures. And Save the Children has estimated that around 85,000 children um, with severe acute malnutrition have died between April 2015 and April and October 2018, which is the last time they were able to get access to a lot of these areas. So this is sort of the background to this ticking time bomb on the coast. And, and you can quite see, having heard Holden's explanation there of what would happen if it were to go off, how it would only exacerbate this incredibly awful situation. And with all of that going on in the background, there's also holding this issue, as I understand it, that the boat itself may have been weaponized deliberately, that groups may have put IEDs on board. They want it to explode. Yes, the key word there is may. There's a lot of uncertainty about exactly what's going on on board the ship. But it has moved from being essentially controlled by a private company with international oversight to being controlled by the Houthis. And they've installed armed units, armed military units on board the ship, which in itself is worrying because it would only take a spark to ignite the crude oil on board, which has been essentially decaying and releasing gases. And because the the normal systems on board a ship that, that sort of pump these gases out and pump inert gases in their place to keep everything stable are no longer operating, there's a worry that it's a real kind of tinderbox. So even if there haven't been deliberate attempts to attach mines or other explosives to it, the mere presence of weapons and perhaps slightly jumpy um, soldiers on board is, could, could turn it into a bomb regardless of intention. There, there are so many aspects to this that make it really terrifying. You know, there's the human life aspect. There's the economic fallout that would come from this. Um, but, of course, there's also the environmental problems that would ensue, I mean, from a massive oil leak like this. The Red Sea is incredibly valuable. It's an extremely biodiverse ecosystem. Um, and one fact that stood out to me um, was that it has the only coral reefs in the world known to be resistant to sea temperature rises, which is a huge, obviously a huge problem right now. And the reefs that are found here can tolerate a a temperature rise of up to seven degrees Celsius, which is just monumental considering that like most coral reefs are not expected to survive the next sort of 50 years or so due to temperature rises of maybe even two degrees Celsius. So environmentally, like these, these coral reefs are potentially crucial to the survival of, of reefs in general. And that's just one example of, 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 the, of the environmental impact of, of this kind of problem. Of the country, 20 countries deemed most vulnerable to climate change, 12 of them are currently involved in ongoing conflicts. 
Um, the Notre Dame Global Adaptation Initiative Index basically ranks a country's vulnerability to climate change um, and sets that against its ability to improve its resistance. And of those 20 countries that are most vulnerable, Yemen, Mali, Afghanistan, the DRC and Somalia are among the lowest ranked and are all currently dealing with ongoing heated violent conflicts. That's not to say that there's necessarily a direct correlation you know, between climate change and conflict, but what it does suggest is that countries that have to endure long periods of conflict are currently and will in the future be less able to cope with climate change precisely because their ability to adapt is weakened by those conflicts. And when we look at some of the side effects that we see in the West of conflicts in the Middle East and Africa, it's the displacement of people is the thing that is always the thing that politically becomes very um, heated here. Combine that then with an inability to respond to climate change, which is predicted to be the biggest driver of global migration in the next sort of 100 years. And you can see how this is a humanitarian crisis, not only taking place in Africa and the Middle East and the areas where these conflicts are taking place, but that will soon be on Europe's doorstep, as we've seen before. Yeah. And even for the people that are left behind, I guess, Holden, there's an impact, obviously, on, I guess, health and wellness of not having the environment around you that you you should. I mean, you take a country like Afghanistan, clearly such a beautiful, mountainous, verdant region in places as well as desert. And if those places are decimated, it's not a place people want to live, even when the country does get back on its feet. Yeah, and that that can become a a bit of a vicious circle as well, where if you have yeah, environmental degradation that results from conflict and then that affects people's quality of life that in itself would mean that care for and attention to the environment drops down that list of priorities of people just seek to feed themselves at all cost and feeding yourself at all cost might mean that you are stripping away more forests and you know plowing up more more um, more virgin land and you can't really blame people for not valuing environmental quality for its own right and yet yes it does have that that um, knock-on effect of quality of life that's likely to become self-sustaining it does it feels it feels as if this whole situation this ship is a, it's a huge floating metaphor it's you know you've got this enormous tanker that was meant to fulfill our demand for cheap energy and it's now sitting there at a time when its cargo must be getting more valuable day by day you look at the, the energy prices oil prices gas prices and yet it's also getting more likely to explode at any time. And the problem apparently could be solved in a month if everyone who knew what they were doing could get together and could be allowed permission to get aboard and pipe off the oil and refloat the tanker and take it away for scrap. But instead, there's just this endless squabbling about who's allowed access and where inspections would take place and you know, who can safely be allowed in. And so the people who really understand the consequences of this are just sitting back and waiting for catastrophe. Yeah, I mean, the the approach from the United Nations, well, probably not the approach, that's maybe unfair. The conclusion from the United Nations, it seems, Jess, is sort of, we don't do oil tankers. Like, we'd we'd like to help out because we see the environmental problems, the humanitarian problems, but we're not experts on oil tankers. I mean, you just sort of think, well, yeah, but you know the experts. Why is there not more of an effort to coalesce everybody? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, again, like, how can you negotiate with people who refuse to negotiate with you and and who are really, like I said, weaponizing this thing? I mean, it's not that nothing is is can be done or that people don't want to do anything. It's just what can you do? And in your relation to your point about the UN, Ollie, there is actually kind of a serious legal thing going on here as well. The, The Geneva Convention, which admittedly hasn't been observed, particularly during the Yemeni civil war, does protect the natural environment against widespread long-term and severe damage. It's additional protocol one to the Geneva Convention. So there is also an argument that the UN shouldn't be able to say we don't do oil tankers, as you phrased it, because there is a legal framework in place that you could argue would mean that the UN has to intervene in this situation because the Geneva Convention is being ignored and would be broken if this were to explode and whichever side of this conflict you then hold responsible for that would be responsible for having broken the Geneva Conventions. It's a particularly grim story to make a prediction about, I guess, because you're predicting the death of, you know, thousands of people and or animals and a catastrophe. But what, Holden, do you think is actually going to happen here? Do you think people will intervene before it explodes? It's it's so hard to say. And I think that that level of uncertainty is why we are sat in this position of deadlock. It's reading the coverage of this is if you look back at reporting on the likelihood of a pandemic that was written, say, five years ago, there's that same, or about um, antibiotic resistance now, there's that same sense that there's 
we know we're sitting on something that might blow up in our faces, but we don't know when and we can't describe exactly what the consequences will be. And there's also huge inertia, huge vested interest in people who would prefer to believe that nothing bad will happen. And that in itself increases the chances that something bad will happen. Okay, Jess, you have something totally different for us next after this. Okay, Jess, your turn. What do you think this week should be remembered for? Hollywood's crews go from behind the scenes to center stage. When you start shooting an episode in two days, you're you're just pushing too hard. Um, when I came here in 2004 from San Diego, my first show out of the gate, we shot it over the course of a month and a half, and it was eight episodes, um, and it was safe. Mark Jacobs, a member of the Directors Guild of Film, speaking to KTLA 5 News on Monday. Uh, Jess, not just a local Los Angeles story, this one, but something that could affect us all. Tell us what's going on. So this week, the um, International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees, which is a mouthful, but it's a union that represents um, lots of the film and TV industry's crew members. They voted to authorize a strike in an effort to have some leverage to negotiate a better contract for a bunch of its members, some 60,000 of its members. And this union represents people who traditionally work behind the scenes, as we would say. So cinematographers, um, cameramen, hair and makeup, script supervisors, you know, the people we don't really see very often, but who make shows and films happen. And so they are trying to negotiate um, a better contract with many of the big uh, studios, including the streaming platforms like Netflix and um, Apple. So they haven't decided to go on strike, but they have decided to authorize a strike. So 99% of the union members said, yes, we want to be able to have the option to go on strike if these negotiations go south. And how unusual is that in Hollywood? It's actually quite unusual. I mean, contracts are renegotiated every sort of three years with unions like this. Um, so the last time this sort of thing happened was in 2007 when the, the Writers Guild of America staged a walkout for 100 days. Um, it lasted for 14 weeks and, and it was quite devastating. It cost the California economy like $2 billion. And um, yeah, it was it was quite a big deal. So this is, you know, it's not particularly common, but it, it does have the potential to really just sort of stop production on many shows and films that we would be consuming. Everything would just come to a halt. And the dispute seems to arise, Holden, from a provision that there was back in the day, kind of before Netflix and Amazon Prime became the beer moths that they are now, that that would be considered new media. So your rates and your meals that were provided and your overall hours could be a little bit more flexible if you were working for, you know, a YouTuber was kind of what that was intended for, right? If you're making a commercial that's only going to be a video podcast, for example, you can see why the union were flexible. And now they're saying, well, Apple TV is new media and they're one of the biggest companies in the world. Yeah, there's a little bit of a parallel here with that earlier writer's strike, which also arose around the idea of digital repeats and the fees that writers would get there. So I think it is it is a case of an industry finding its way. And yeah, you can you can entirely understand the union saying that, OK, the distinction that existed previously between something that might have been quite low budget and experimental and a standard studio movie just doesn't exist anymore like there's a huge huge amount of money in um in material that's produced for streaming and i think there's also just much more demand and there's a covid element to this story here as well where productions got behind schedule and ended up costing more because of safety measures that had to be put in place during the pandemic but at the same time demand was increasing from netflix and disney and they just wanted as many um, possible episodes as could be delivered so people are having to work much longer hours to deal with this and um, they're not getting the same benefits that they would be if they were if they were working on a tv or a, a film set well that's the thing isn't it joe the demand is there and the demand is from us like, we're the ones consuming box sets on an endless basis. We're the ones that expect to log on to these streaming platforms and been given a brand new blue chip 24-part series to consume in a week. And actually, even if you increase higher base pay for the people working on it, there are only so many 
best boys and grips and set designers. And presumably they're going to have to work really, really hard, harder than they used to, to make that stuff. And as you say, it's, it's our insatiable desire for, for more content that is driving these issues. But ironically, we may all have to go back to our box sets if this strike goes ahead because the, thing, the new things will all be shut down. There is a consumer responsibility element to this as well. And, and the studios are obviously, as you say, trying to make up for, for lost time and money because, like everybody, they've been in and out of lockdowns for the last 18 to sort of 12 months. They're now churning out lots and lots of shows with big actors because that's what the streaming subscribers want. But it does mean invariably cutting corners on the people that we don't see, you know, and that's that's where this dispute has come from. I'm not really sure how you resolve that because it's a, it's a similar sort of theme to that which we've seen with almost everything that has gone online. You know, a similar theme has taken place in journalism over the last sort of two decades that there's just now a sort of insatiable desire for, for more and more content and it results in lots of people, I hasten to add not at the week.co.uk, being forced into quite bad contracts where they just sit at a desk and churn out stories all day because the, the internet requires... And, and that's sort of the same phenomenon that we're seeing now with these streaming services. They've got an endless platform to fill with shows. They don't have a 24-hour schedule anymore. And invariably, the people that put these shows together are suffering as a result of the fact that that, that endless space needs filling. Except, Jess, we saw with the writer's strike, didn't we? Not always successfully, but it happened. The likes of actors writing their own scripts so that there was something to film. That was the workaround, right? You could imagine, couldn't you, if you're Netflix or Amazon or whoever and you, you don't want to pay up, just saying, well, we'll, we'll prioritise our content from Germany or Israel or Korea. You know, Squid Game's massive at the moment, doesn't it? That bypasses Hollywood. So there is other content from other people who don't need a unionised contract. Could this backfire? Yeah, yes. I mean, they could do that. They could. I don't think that they will. I think that the ramifications of that would be huge. I mean, this is a massive, massive industry. There's a lot of momentum around this, and there's a lot of sympathy for these workers now, both in and outside of Hollywood. There's a huge sort of press push, like the um, the media is really focusing on this, the horror stories that are sort of coming out of out of the woodwork, people writing about the working conditions that they're going through. I mean, yes, you have to wonder whether the demand for new content would outweigh uh, our sympathy for the workers behind the camera. But I, I do think that, that the streaming platforms have to do something. They can't hold this back forever, I don't think. It has momentum. And I think, honestly, like they've sort of got to own up to how big they are now. I mean, they're really trying to milk the fact that, you know, back in 2009 or whatever, they said, oh, we're still new. We're still new. We're still, you know, small. You're taking a chance with us. And so we're going to be a bit flexible with the working conditions. I mean, even Apple, Apple said recently that because its streaming service has fewer than 20 million subscribers in the US and Canada, it's allowed to pay crews lower rates uh, than other streaming services. And then that's just like ludicrous. That's ridiculous. I mean, these these companies are making massive, massive amounts of money and they're winning big, big awards. So, you know, it, it, they kind of want to have it both ways. They want to say, oh, we're prestigious and, and award winning, but we're still new and little. And so we're not going to pay our, our workers. I suppose, though, that what they're trying to articulate is that the whole Apple TV idea, it, albeit from one of the world's biggest companies, is a punt. And, you know, they don't charge very much for that service to the end user. And they don't know how many people are going to be watching these projects. Whereas if you're making the Bond movie, as I said at the beginning, OK, there were some choppy waters, Holden. But basically, you knew, didn't you, if you were MGM, that's going to be a popular film that's open for the whole world. You have to pay up to subscribe to Apple. So it, it doesn't have the inbuilt globalized scale that something like a huge movie production can. That might be true, but I think if if Apple is asking people to pay up front for its subscription service, that in consumers' minds, that's going to create more of an expectation that the people who are producing that content will be paid. I think possibly even more so than for a TV service where it may be advertiser funded. And so there's just less, there's less consumer attention paid to the economics of that. But I feel that the, you know, Apple, people, people know that Apple is a rich company, people are happy to pay large amounts of money for the hardware. They're being encouraged to pay increasing amounts of money for the content, which may be a new a newer business model than the, the, the business model of selling expensive phones. I don't think they will be able to get away with pleading poverty in the same way. I think where the unions and the workers may come up against a problem in trying to drive up 
wages in this area is more that there are so many people willing to work in the industry and and who still do see it as a glamorous and exciting place to be and so are, are prepared to take relatively low salaries particularly in in first jobs and to to do almost anything and work long hours because they feel that will lead to a more lucrative job or even just a more exciting job in the long run yeah so an interesting point made on the week.com actually joe in their coverage of this which was that when you watch something on netflix the credits get squeezed down into a little box and then instantly fade away because they're trying to hawk you something else to hook into and yeah, you think back to the 70s when those big films started with the credits, didn't they? It, you couldn't watch the film without finding out who the cinematographer and the best boy was. Do you think slowly, like Hollywood has actually eroded our interest in who's behind the scenes? We don't have such a knowledge about that anymore. I'm not sure, you know, if you think about the sort of the the big Hollywood directors that still exist, they aren't sort of all plus 70. You know, they're not all the Martin Scorsese's of this world. I think people are still interested in, in who in who is directing the big Hollywood blockbusters. Yeah, but not the unit location manager. That's what I mean. Like, yeah, the directors are on the ticket, aren't they? But you used to have to sit through the names of everybody involved. True. Yeah, true. I think you're, you're right. And, you know, the next episode starts in 20 seconds box certainly doesn't sort of incentivize you paying attention to who made the show. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not sure there was ever a world where people left, you know, a Hitchcock film and said, "I wonder who the runner on that was." Um, but, <laughs> but no, I, I can see, I can quite see your point. I think actually, at its core, this is a this is kind of a very old fashioned problem smashing into sort of new media, which is a union fighting against very big behemoth companies. And in that regard, my sympathies do lie with the workers in that they are having to go up against some pretty ludicrous arguments here, really. You know, Netflix posted revenues of $7.3 billion last year, and for them to turn around to a group of people working long hours for often poor pay and, and often in not hugely safe conditions and say that they're a sort of budding upstart company is, is a bit laughable. Um, in that regard, I, I do feel for them. Whether or not, you know, the sympathy for the workers extends to, to people revoking their Netflix subscriptions, I'm not so sure. Um, but I, as I say, I can quite see I can quite see their argument and I think that Netflix and Apple TV Plus and all these places are going to have a pretty tough time if they're going to try and position themselves as, as the new kids on the block. There's also, I suppose, the star power, isn't there, this time round? Even during the writer's strike, Jess, you know, social media wasn't as big a deal as it is now. I've already seen just sort of glimpsing into the coverage of this this morning, a, an Instagram post with, I think it was Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin posing with their hands in the air in solidarity. Uh, you know, you could imagine, couldn't you, that if it gets to the point where those big streaming stars, Jennifer Aniston and Reese Witherspoon, are doing the same, it just becomes too embarrassing for the companies not to climb down over this. Sure. I do wonder, actually, if that's going to be the tipping point, because the streaming companies are willing, obviously, to pay lots of money for big name actors. But if the big name actors aren't willing to participate because the people behind the scenes aren't get being paid well enough, then that really changes the balance f uh, for, for the streaming platforms. And I do wonder if, if that's going, going to happen more. I think it's starting to happen. Now, it's also sort of a political problem. So there's um, something like 200 state and federal lawmakers, all of them Democratic, <laughs> are signing letters to the organization who represents the streaming platforms, to the, their president, um, urging them to, to, to come up with a deal to prevent this, the labor shortage. So it's it's definitely gaining momentum. And I yeah, I do wonder whether or not if 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 the big Hollywood stars who bring in most of the attention and most of the money for these platforms start to say, actually, we're with those guys over there. That that has a lot of power. OK, finally, though, do you think they will strike? And do you think their terms will be met? Um, the predictions seem to be that they will not strike, that there will be some negotiation that happens here and that everybody will come out either with some with some of what they want, but not everything that they want. Um, I mean, there's a lot at stake, right? The The industry ramifications of this are pretty big. So it's not just the crew union that is is coming up for renewal on its contract. It's also a bunch of other unions. So the writers, the directors, the actors, I mean, a lot of these are due for renewal pretty soon. And if this goes through completely, it, it could change the game for the streaming industry. So I think they'll probably find some middle ground. I don't think they'll shut down. I, who knows? We could in you know a year's time have a real shortage of Netflix shows to mindlessly binge through. Perish the thought. OK, well, as you are all weak staffers, I am contractually obliged to give you a rest break now. We'll be back with Holden after this.
Okay, Holden, you are finishing the show. What do you think this week should be remembered for? Ready or not, here we come. I think we should also be prepared that this will not be the last wave we experience. We are riding one major, one big wave now, but we should be mentally prepared that there will be subsequent waves to follow. Why is that so? It's because we are one of the most COVID-naive populations in the world. Unlike, for example, many other European countries, we have kept infections rate infections in Singapore low for a very long time. Singaporean Minister Lawrence Wong at a news conference on Saturday. Holden, did he say they were COVID naive? What does that mean? Yeah, he's, he's really referring to the fact that Singapore has done such a good job um, of, of keeping COVID out of, of its territory. Um, it, it's had some of the tightest restrictions on incoming visitors in the world and also been very strict in terms of internal lockdowns and um, isolating cases and track, tracking contacts. But all that began to change a couple of months ago when Singapore unveiled this plan to start living with the virus um, alongside a, a very high vaccination rate. And so it lifted internal restrictions. It allowed visitors, vaccinated visitors from Germany and Brunei to come into the country without quarantine as part of a a test case which it intended to um, expand to other countries in time. Okay, all of this is very interesting if you're listening in Singapore, but, you know, we all have our own international concerns regarding COVID. Everyone's got their own policy. Why should we care in Britain about this? Well, I think what's interesting about it is that what happened there as a result of this reopening is what we have seen elsewhere in Europe, in the US, um, in, in many places of the world which had restrictions and then started to ease them. But the reaction in Singapore has been very different. The population has become very uneasy about it. The FT had a report earlier this week saying that there's been panic in certain places and that, that people are, are really unnerved and alarmed by the rise in cases. And so I think it's just it, we, we're at the point of the pandemic where the, the relatively few countries who've done a really good job of keeping COVID out, you know, Australia and New Zealand spring to mind, particularly New Zealand, are now having to reckon with what comes next. And particularly countries where there's a, a heavy dependence on tourism or on international trade or of keeping borders open, there's going to be a big psychological shift in a, moving from a, an 18 month period where you've been telling your populations you you cannot get this disease you've got to do everything you possible possibly can to keep it out to saying now we are going to deliberately let it in we've protected ourselves as much as we can with vaccinations but now we've just got to open up and live with it as best we can and i suppose each individual country's attitude to that dilemma is going to change based on their own culture and the business opportunity joe Absolutely. And I don't, I don't think it's any coincidence that places like um, Singapore and, and Indonesia as well have had to start thinking about reopening because they are very reliant on, on tourism as a major industry. I think what Holden's just described is really interesting. And I think a lot of it is to do with how the pandemic and how the last 18 months have affected people's perceptions of, of risk. You know, there was a period of time where in the UK it felt like a risk to go out for a walk or to go into a supermarket. And, I so, and so I think even though cases here are still quite high, relative to that period of time 18 months ago where, where everything felt very dangerous, I think people feel fairly safe. And I think that's evidence if you walk around outside or, or even go to an airport, as I did a couple of weeks ago, and you see lots of Brits travelling again. What I think is interesting in relation to these examples, places like Singapore, Australia, New Zealand especially, is that they're having to sort of shift away from this sort of what was loosely termed a zero COVID approach and because their populations have become very used to that as a, as a line of government messaging, they're very uncomfortable now with the possibility of COVID spreading at all and very uncomfortable with the idea of, of reopening. And it's creating a massive headache for a lot of these people. You know, New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern is, is if you watch her press conferences, very carefully trying to articulate this, this new strategy for New Zealand because it was very easy to use the sort of blunt hammer of we must keep this virus out at all costs. It's far more difficult politically for her to articulate this idea of, you know, relative risk and, and allowing people slowly to come back to New Zealand and to open up. So complex and difficult decisions for international governments to make, Jess, but that is the sort of thing international governments are elected to decide. What's different about this is that it also has an implication for us as individual travellers, doesn't it? A country may have an open border and it may be saying, come and support our tourist industry. But you as a traveller might think, but I'm coming from a high COVID country, should I go and visit a low COVID country? That's right. Yeah. I mean, I think it requires a sort of ethical evaluation here of our travel habits. Um, you know, there's been this sort of 
urging of all of us to sort of get back to normal and, and, you know, get back into our holidays and all of that. And I think that COVID requires a rethinking of a lot of our behavior, but travel certainly, I mean, in many ways, travel is one of the things that, that really got us into this mess more than once, right? So the virus spread worldwide because we were traveling and we were slow to sl- close our borders. And then it there were several new variants that spread globally because, again, we didn't contain them fast enough. I mean, so in one way, travel does sort of exacerbate the problem. But you're, you're sort of weighing that up with the economic benefits of bringing your money and your business to a, a, a country that could use it. So that's a difficult decision to make. I mean, you know, there are a lot of proposals for how you could weigh the pros and cons. You know, how vaccinated is the country you want to visit? Is your travel essential? How high are the vaccination rates where you are? Are you yourself vaccinated? And and this would all be really different if we knew for sure that the vaccines prevented transmission. But we don't know that. In fact, we know that they probably don't do that. And so there is always a risk that you will be bringing COVID with you. It's just how high is the risk and, and, and how dangerous is that? You know, how are, are the hospitals equipped to deal with you if you go? I mean, that was always a question no matter what. You could get injured when you're on, on holiday and be a burden to the hospitals. But it's different now. And it's very finely balanced, isn't it, Holden? Because it strikes me that the very countries who couldn't afford a vaccine rollout are the same ones that desperately need their tourist income back. So it's not a straightforward answer even if you ask yourself these questions. No, and even within some of these countries, there are sort of awkward ethical situations where the vaccines that they do have have been funneled towards the tourist areas so that they can reopen particular islands. I know this has happened in in Thailand where Phuket was was prioritised for vaccination and then opened as a essentially an, an island that would be a COVID secure tourist destination for the economic benefit of, of Thailand as a whole. And that does sit a bit uncomfortably, but it is also entirely understandable. And the weighing up of costs and benefits is really difficult because often the the costs may exist on an entirely different plain to the benefits you're talking about you know the the benefits of travel can be quite ephemeral but that doesn't mean they're any the less profound like being able to get away somewhere being able to um you know talk to people from different cultures being able just to sit on a beach for a week may be really important for some people right now particularly after the year the you know i keep saying the year we've been through it's the 18 months we've been through it soon will be the two years we've been through and i, I don't think you can overlook those those soft benefits of travel even though you do have to be aware of the the potential risks the potential costs that come along with it and i wonder joe if covid has recalibrated our attitude to those other risks that jess mentioned as well anyway you know that i'm sure there are plenty of people listening to this who previously would feel like they only wanted to travel to other countries that were as economically developed as we are because they felt safer there who now might be thinking, actually, yeah, I would go to Russia on holiday or I would go to Bangladesh or whatever because, actually, I could get killed by an infectious disease on my high street. I do wonder. I do wonder whether potentially dealing with imminent danger or danger just outside the window for 18 months would result in you being slightly more relaxed about about other things that might have panicked you slightly more before. Um, I I think in relation to the sort of ethical questions of of travelling, travelling in the era of COVID. There is a Guardian piece that slightly piously runs through some of the things that you should kind of consider. For example, you know, as just mentioned, the rate of vaccination in the country you're going to. You know, one of the things they suggest is, am I putting the hourly employees within the airport that I'm travelling through at risk due to my travel, which is a very guardian point to make? You know, what's the current rate of COVID-19 infections where I'm going, which is a fairly obvious thing. I think these are kind of questions that people are going to weigh up now and, and they're not unreasonable things to, to weigh up. I think actually, sort of, as Colin just said, the benefits of travel are sometimes quite difficult to grasp and sometimes slightly intangible. And I think that actually what this what this situation requires really is just sort of allowing people to make their own minds up and, and take their own risks and, and assess the situation and, and make their own decisions. Because I think that as I sort of said, the Guardian's sort of pious listing of things to run through before you go on holiday, I don't think is necessarily helpful for anybody. And I just don't think that the sort of curtain twitching attitude that has prevailed slightly during the pandemic in terms of, you know, checking who's out, clapping for carers, but also checking how many times your neighbours go out for a walk would really not be helpful in a situation where travel is going to remain risky for quite a, quite a time. I suppose also you might want to support commercial business interests 
you know, <laughs> that doesn't seem like a very noble thing to do. But actually, you might have a favourite hotel or resort somewhere in the world, Jess, that it absolutely depends on foreign visitors coming. And if they don't, they will go bankrupt. Yeah, I suppose that could be a, a motivation for some people. I mean, if you have a, a boutique hotel in Bali or something that you that you love and want to keep, keep going, then find more power to you. But uh, I guess for me, like what this has demonstrated the last 18 months or so has demonstrated how like how connected we are uh, that sounds very cliche but like how our personal actions affect have just such a strong ripple effect and and with travel I mean I I hope I my hope is that people start to think a bit more carefully about why they're traveling um, and and I think there's also already a movement um, you know, for sort of slow travel is what it's called. That's been around for several years of like maybe staying a bit closer to home or like taking a train or like even just spending a bit more time in one place rather than sort of jet setting from city to city and and seeing sort of the top level, you know, tourist destinations and, and just trying to be a bit more considerate about the way that we travel. And, and I, I also think that cost is going to play a huge part here. I think travel will in the incoming years probably get a bit more expensive. And I think that will make people think differently about where they go, how they go. So I think I think actually this is a question about what what travel is going to be like in the next f- 10 years even. Um, and I think it's really important. These are important conversations for us for us to be having. I don't know that I want us to go back to a world where, you know, 15 pound Ryanair flights are, are the are the norm. I don't think that should have really ever been the norm. Well, I'm glad we had the conversation because it does mean that I can justify my half-term trip to Disneyland Paris as research. Uh, we are going on the boat. Uh, that, my thanks to uh, Jess and Holden and Joe for their stories uh, this week. Remember, you can follow this show for free. Just search for The Week Unwrapped wherever you get your podcasts. I've been Ollie Man. Our music is by Tom Morby, the producer Sophie King at Rethink Audio. And until we meet again to unwrap next week, bye-bye. Bye-bye.